Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew in the 14th chapter. Listen now for God's word to you. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side of the sea, while he dismissed the crowd. And after Jesus had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far off from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, Jesus came walking towards them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter spoke to Jesus saying, Lord, if it is really you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when Peter noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began and beginning to seek, sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped Jesus, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the living word of God will stand forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is a place for a perfect storm. This Sea of Galilee. I would call it a sea lift because it's only 13 miles long and 8 miles wide at the widest point, or just a little over 100 square miles. Due north of the Sea of Galilee is Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is 93 hundred feet above sea level. Do you know that they have a ski resort in Israel on Mount Hermon? To the east as the ridge of the mountains go, directly due east from the Sea of Galilee, it reaches peaks of about 5,000 feet. Due west is the Mediterranean Sea, a real sea. And it's interesting to note that it is that place for violent and sudden storms because the cold air from Mount Hermon creeps down into what is a valley, a, a gorge in a sense, that the Sea of Galilee is six, 700 feet below sea level. That's 10,000 feet difference in elevation. And that cold air at night falls and sweeps down, and from the east it comes, and from the west it meets the moist air of the Mediterranean Sea. And if you watch the weather people, you know that is a place 
for great storms. That's the setting. Now, the other setting I would mention is that the disciples have been given authority. Authority to cast out demons, to heal the sick, and other infirmities. They have stood with Jesus by him in feeding of the five thousands, which was last week's lectionary. They also are the gatekeepers, the ones who decide who gets personal contact with Jesus and those who do not. We all know the story of the little children, the parents pushing the little children forward to sit at the knee of Jesus so Jesus could hold them. And the disciples come across like gruff sounding bears. Get these children out of here. And Jesus says, do not discourage for to such belong the kingdom of heaven. The disciples, I would say, feel now that they are special, invigorated by authority, invincible, made invincible by God's blessing. And I suspect that they believe that in the great kingdom that is to come, one would sit on the right hand and the others would sit on the left, if James and John have their way, arguing about who gets the seat of honor in the great coming kingdom. But you know what? The forces of nature just don't care. The forces of nature do not respect the rich or the poor, the elite or the ostracized, the learned or the not so learned, and all of us who fall between those parameters. The earthquakes do not care who your daddy is. Tornadoes don't care who you know Hurricanes don't care how much your bank account holds. And fires don't care your socioeconomic class nor your political leanings. Just ask the people in Maui. Storms come in spite of who we are. I do know that we can learn things from these events. They teach us that the power we assume we have that is so great is so minuscule when compared to the power of nature. We cannot control the storms. We simply ride them out if, we're, if we are able. I know the power of storms on the sea. In 1974, I was in the northern North Atlantic. January and February, somewhere I think off the coast of Newfoundland. And any delusions of grandeur that I had were simply washed away when that spray came over the bow all over my foul weather gear. I was so small in comparison to 30-foot swells. Or something most of us can relate to or will one day. We're so healthy, vigorous life, then all of a sudden, we find ourselves in hospital beds dependent upon other human beings to help us. 
I don't believe God sent the storm to put the disciples' growing big head in line with God's will, to teach them a lesson. But God did create the cosmos, and eventually in the cosmos, why, it will correct any grandiose ideas that we may be harboring about ourselves. It's the way of life. This text is about fear. The storm. The disciples fear it. As sailors, they understood the risks of sailing at night when the cold air masses fall, when the warm comes to shore. And the wind arises suddenly. And it threatens to swamp of their fishing boats and drown these disciple sailors. This fear is grounded in the comprehension of the danger that they have placed themselves in. But there is another fear here. The fear of what they cannot comprehend. It's a ghost. The Greek word here is phantasma, from which we derive the word phantasm. Even, I think, a movie was made, a strange movie, in fact, a phantasm. It's a frightening thing for them to see. And I suspect they believe when they see this ghost that being superstitious people, that the veil between the dead and the living has somehow ripped apart and the ghost has crept into the land of the living. And if they can see it, in all probability, they're about ready to join it, this ghost. There is the fear of the unknown that is present here. This is a different kind of fear. I could throw some big words at you, but they would serve no purpose of this kind. Existential angst or some... Uh, uh, Kierkegaardian kind of language, but it's a fear without a name. It's a fear that we cannot comprehend. We cannot put our finger on it. It's a fear that words do not accurately describe. It's a fear that can arise at any time and strangle the throats of those even on placid seas or in safe harbor or at dry dock. It's a fear about our destiny. It's a fear that when we finally, in the bard's terms, throw off this mortal coil, or we have that mortal coil thrown off for us, what happens then? It's a fear that whispers sometimes, shouts at others. Is it true? Is it really true that life can go on? Is it really true that God cares for us? There are eight billion people on this planet. Is it true that God cares about the eight billion? Or are we just fooling ourselves? Some might ask, is it true 
that there really is a God? Is it true that my life means something more than just the few who know me? Is it true that God is love? Fear of the storm is immediate. Fear of destiny and meaning is lasting. Both are characteristics of being a human. One is for survival often, and the other, why? That transcends just mere survival, doesn't it? It's so existential, isn't it? Now, we know that story. We learned it when we were this small. Jesus is walking on the water, doing what seems to be impossible. I can't explain it. I don't know if he was hopping from crest to crest or slithering from trough to trough. I think it serves no lasting purpose for me to try addressing those things to defy what I know as physics. But Jesus' words are addressed to the disciples and their fear of both kinds. Take heart. It is I Be not afraid. Matthew's gospel is written with the Jewish Christian in mind. And there is a sneaky part of the Greek language in the three things that Jesus says. Especially around the term, it is I. That Greek word is ego and me which strictly translates into I am. Well, Moses goes up on the mountain, sees a burning bush, and God says to him, I want you to go tell old Pharaoh over there in Egypt to let my people go. And Moses asks this question, who shall I say is sending me? And God's response is, I am. Hebrew, Yahweh. Greek, ego ami. English, I am is sending me. I am says, let my people go. And that is the divine name of God. It is so holy that good Old Testament professors, of which I had, will not say Yahweh. They always say Adonai, Lord. So whenever you read Lord, that's Adonai. But it may have originally been Yahweh. They cannot say that name. I am, Jesus tells them. The Jews would have understood. I am the God of eternal presence. Take heart. I am. Be not afraid. I am. The passage is about Fear and faith. Now, I will tell you, I don't think I am taking a quantum leap with the text when I tell you that when the disciples are in that boat, in the storm, they see a ghost. I do not believe they are discussing 
theories of the doctrine of atonement. I do not believe they're talking about theories of divine human nature. They are not talking about Trinitarian formulas. No. They are rowing for all their worth. And perhaps that's where most of us find ourselves in life. Rowing for all we're worth. We are often storm-weary sailors in matchbox boats. I find comfort in identifying myself my own self, with most people. I think that is the good news for so many of us. We need to know that I am is there. Lord, I'm rowing as fast as I can, and yet I still find fear. Lord. And sometimes I think regarding these the kind of fear that we can, just can't get our hands on or don't have the words to describe perhaps that might even be the movement of God in us telling us to wake up. You cannot live your life dictated by your fears. Your fears will enchain you. But Jesus says, to, why did you doubt? I don't think he's chastising so much as pointing out that it's a choice. He's reminding us that the storms in life will come and phantoms will appear. But we cannot live a fulfilled life if our fears dictate to us the roads we travel in life. For if we have at that point trusted only in ourselves, then the voyage we take will be perilous. And Jesus is asking, do you trust that I am present with you? Do you trust that I will never forsake you, even until the close of the age, as it says in the Gospels. Karl Barth, the Swiss theologian, once made this simple statement that was so strong. Jesus, the Christ is God's yes to the world. And Jesus is God's yes to those who are rowing as, as fast as we can against the wind. We either trust that I am is with us, or we do not. It is a choice, you see. But this Jesus, who comes to us at strange times and strange places, is someone we welcome aboard. 
And that makes all the difference. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I will rise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me here.